Hello, my name is Dr. Gamo and I am an associate professor at West Coast University. At the same time, I'm also an assistant professor at the David Jeffett School of Medicine at UCLA. Today we're going to talk about the human blood, okay, uh, which is part of the lecture on the topic of the cardiovascular and circulatory system. We know the importance of the human blood. It is in the blood where you have uh, the different cells, such as red blood cell, white blood cell, and a fragment of a cell called platelet. And today we're going to talk about the important components of blood that is important in terms of the human body. Okay. Now, in this particular slide, you can see here the a list of the functions of the human blood with regards to its capacity to transport nutrients, such as your glucose, your proteins, and uh, basically your lipids or fats. Oxygen and carbon dioxide are transported through the red blood cell, as we everybody knows. Okay, and of course, hormones are produced by endocrine glands. And because of the fact that endocrine glands do not have ducts, they will be forced to release the hormones directly into the blood circulation. So these hormones now will be flowing in the blood that is found inside the blood vessels. And of course you have your ions, such as your uh, electrolytes, such as your sodium, okay, your calcium, potassium. And the metabolic waste includes the waste such as the urea, the creatinine, and uric acid brought about by the breakdown of protein, and it is the function of the kidney to be able to filter the blood. Okay, and therefore, by removing this waste from the blood, the urea, the creatinine, and uric acid will be brought out via the urine. Okay, now of course, uh, leukocytes, as we know, is also known as white blood cell, and this is the one that is responsible to fight against infection. It's considered the soldiers of the body and stabilization of body temperature and other functions of the human blood. The loss of body fluids via the clotting process. So when you get a patient in the emergency room with a stab wound or a gunshot wound and he's bleeding, it is important to note that it is the platelet, which is a component of the blood that allows the, the blood to clot and to stop the bleeding. That's why it's imperative that doctors are able to determine where is the bleeding coming from, at the same time stop the bleeding, and doing, if necessary, to do surgery on that and then on the site where the bleeding is coming from and at the same time, if the amount of blood loss was significant, then there is a need to do blood transfusion, okay? Stabilization of pH, the normal pH of blood ranges from 3.5 to 5, uh, um, 5, okay, the, the normal pH of blood is 7.35, is time corrected, to 7.45. Anything below 7.35 is acidic, anything above 7.45 is alkaline. Electrolyte balance refers to uh, the amount of sodium, chlorine, potassium, calcium in the human blood. For example, in the case of potassium, it should raise between 3.5 to 5 milliequivalents per liter. Anything below 3.5 is hypokalemia, and anything above uh, 5 milliequivalents per liter is considered hyperkalemia. Sodium, on the other hand, ranges from 135 to 145 milliequivalents per liter. Anything below 135 is considered hyponatremia, and anything above 145 is hypernatremia. Now, as we know, blood is made of two things. One is called the plasma, which is the liquid part of the blood. And of course, the other one is known as the form elements. The plasma, being the liquid part, is mostly made up of what? H2O or water. The rest includes your plasma proteins, such as albumin and globulin. And in the case of globulin, there is a special type of globulin called immunoglobulin with uh, Ig, which is immunoglobulin, which means this is also known to be the antibody. And this is necessary to protect us against the enemy or what we call a bacteria or virus, which is known to be a pathogen, a disease-causing organism. 
So the antibody will attack the antigen, which happens to be the foreign body, or in this case, a bacteria or virus. Now, we also have in the plasma, aside from proteins, electrolytes, as I mentioned, which includes your sodium, potassium, chlorine, and the rest of the other electrolytes, and calcium. On the other hand, four elements are made up of the red blood cell, white blood cell, and platelet. The red blood cell is also known as erythrocyte, as you can see in the slide. And the white blood cell is also known as leukocyte, while the platelet, there is no other name because in fact, the platelet is not even a cell, it is a fragment of a cell. Now this cell, called megakaryocyte, as you know, mega means big, megakaryocyte, was fragmented and you end up with the platelet. Now why is the platelet important? Well, essentially the platelet is important for the process of blood clotting. When a patient gets injured and has, is bleeding, you want the blood to stop, a bleeding to stop. So you need what? Clotting to occur. And it will need the presence of your platelet, plus of course your clotting factors produced by the liver such as your fibrinogen. Now, the red blood cell, important for oxygen and carbon dioxide transport, very important for that purpose. And white blood cell, as we said, is part of the immune system, is designed to fight against infection. So what I have shown here right now, it's, it's a similar, a, what they call a concept map which tries to summarize the important words that are related to a particular concept or topic or an idea. So what we, know, what we did here was to, instead of a, a paragraph form or a, uh, a series of words where you have a sentences, you can actually just write down the keywords, blood, made up of two things, plasma and form elements, what makes up the plasma, water, proteins, electrolytes, and then the form elements, you have red blood cell, white blood cell, and platelet. The idea here is that you need to be able to summarize and come up with the key words and key ideas and make sure you understand what they mean. Okay? Now, this is just a breakdown of the blood made up of, as you can see here, the plasma is mostly water, 92%, as you can see in this particular slide. And at the same time, the plasma proteins are either albumin, 60%, you have your globulins, fibrinogen, and other proteins such as enzymes and hormones. Now, as we said, hormones are produced by endocrine glands, and because of the absence of ducts in these glands, they will be forced to release their hormones directly into the blood circulation. Electrolytes, I already mentioned some of them here, calcium, magnesium, potassium, and of course nutrients like you are needed for ATP production, particularly the food we eat, such as your glucose, lipids, carbohydrates, and of course amino acids and I already mentioned some of the waste products that have to be filtered in the blood such as urea, creatinine and uric acid which have to be removed by the kidney and the kidney has to filter the blood and allow this waste to come out in the urine. Now we'll be encountering other waste such as bilirubin and ammonium ions. So again just to, to reiterate the, uh, the blood as we can see here are made up of plasma and form elements which includes this three erythrocyte because it's weightless. The components of the whole blood contribute to the viscosity of the blood. In other words, the presence of these cells and fragments of cell makes it more viscous. For example, if you have increased red blood cell count, for example, in a condition called polycythemia, that would increase the viscosity of the blood. It will become more concentrated because there will be now more solute. Now, you can also separate these components through the process of centrifugation. Centrifugation will be able to separate the plasma component from the cells and the platelets. Now, in a packed cells consists of the following, mostly erythrocytes, as you can see. This is the main component of the packed cell. What about the amount of blood? Now, normally our blood ranges from 4 to 6 liters for men, and for women it ranges from 4 to 5. If the amount of blood is less than normal, let's say less than four, it's called hypovolemia. 
If it ranges between 4 to 6 for men, it is considered normal volemic. And on the other hand, if the amount of blood would be greater than 6 for men and greater than 5 for women, then you have hypervolemia or hypervolemic condition which just means excessive blood volumes. Again, as I said, the normal pH of blood is what? 7.35 to 7.45. This slide, this slide shows you the important component of plasma is basically water. That's why blood is in liquid form, not in solid or gaseous form. The presence of proteins are there, plus other solutions that are important. And of course, this is very important, dissolved oxygen concentration is higher in blood plasma because it is necessary, remember the word diffusion, from high concentration to low, you would expect the presence of the oxygen in the blood to be able to diffuse into the cells via the interstitial fluid compartment. On the other hand, carbon dioxide would be lower in blood plasma but rather higher in the cells because this carbon dioxide is a waste product brought about by normal metabolism of cells. If you recall the word metabolism is the sum of all chemical reactions taking place within the cell. And of course, you have your protein concentration. So, which is important. Take note that these plasma proteins are actually produced by the liver. And the liver, there's only one, it's one in the right upper quadrant. And again, these are the components albumin, globulin, and fibrinogen. Again, to reiterate, the role played by fibrinogen is that it is a clotting factor, which means you, don't, you, you need both platelets and clotting factors for the blood to clot. Now, you can see here, uh, albumin is the smallest of the plasma proteins. Now, you, you need to brush up on the concept of osmosis and osmotic pressure and osmotic pressure. Whenever a compartment has more proteins in them, there is a greater osmotic pressure, which means it can attract more water to come into that compartment. The more proteins, the more attraction. Now, on the other hand, globulins, there are two major types. Your immunoglobulins, which I mentioned, are antibodies, right? And therefore, they are very important against the fight against bacterial or viral infection, which happens to be the antigen. And we also have what we call the transport globulins, which transport ions and hormones. So again, what is fibrinogen? It is what? A clotting factor, important for blood clotting. And when your blood, if you remove the clotting protein, it's now called serum. So whenever I say serum, sodium, the specimen is obviously blood, which of course you have removed the clotting proteins. So, take note that in the case of your form elements, majority of the form elements is made up of red blood blood cells. See, it's 99.9%. Platelets is less than 0.1, which is extremely important for clotting. And in the case of your white blood cells, take note that in the white blood cells, so WBC, you have granulocytes, and the other one is A without granules in the cytoplasm. Granulocytes. Under the word granulocytes, you have three neutrophils. Eosinophil. And the third one would be basophil. Now, make sure you know the numbers and values here. 70% is the highest number for neutrophils. Anything above 70%, means the value of neutrophils is elevated and in the field of medicine that is significant because it means that there, you could be dealing with a possible one. Bacterial infection. So that is very important. The other hand, on the other hand, the fill is elevated and you can see the value from 2 to 4 percent. Anything above 4 percent is elevation of the eucinophil. Two things. Allergy and the presence of parasites, like intestinal worms. So, both allergy and parasitism can lead to the increased levels of eosinophil. Now, the base of field can be elevated when there is the presence of allergy too. And with the different mechanism involving the mast cells, which releases histamine, which causes vasodilation. That's why whenever there's an allergy, you increase uh, blood flow to a specific area because histamine is really important too, aside from these structures here. Okay, now, as we can see, you have the red blood cell there, you have the uh, white blood cells, the neutrophil, eosinophil, and basophils 
are essentially what we call granulocytes because you can actually see granules within their cytoplasm. On the other hand, your agranulocytes do not have granules in the cytoplasm. There are two of them, lymphocyte and monocyte. The monocyte is quite large, that's why it's called macrophage. Macro means big or giant, and then phage means a cell that eats another cell, and the word phago means to eat. So this can actually eat a bacterial cell, a cell eating another bacterial cell. Now the lymphocytes, there are three of them. And in the case of your um, lymphocytes, it can either be T, B, and NK. The T lymphocytes is important for cell mediated immunity, which means these are cells that can attack another cell. And in, in fact, later on, when we talk about the T cells, there are many forms of T cells. T uh, memory T cells, you have your cytotoxic T cells. And um, of course, the B cells would be important in the production of antibodies because the B cells becomes the plasma cell, and the plasma cell will be responsible for producing your antibodies or what we call immunoglobulins and therefore this will be important in the attack for the attack of the antigen by these antibodies produced by the plasma cell which were originally your B lymphocytes okay so again hematocrit is just your also known as pack cell volume and take note that in men is 45 percent in women it is 42 percent Red blood cells, you have 5.4 million per cubic millimeter for men and then 4.8 million per cubic millimeter for women. Whenever the red blood cell count is low, it's called anemia, A-N-E-M-I-A. -E when the red blood cell count is high, then it is considered polycythemia. So the red blood cell is a biconcave. It's like a crispy cream donut. As it gets older, it loses its organelles, particularly also the nucleus. It loses the mitochondria and the other organelles too. So lac cell organet is very, very small, by the way. It's only 7.7 .7 microns. It's enough to pass through the capillary. And of course, it contains hemoglobin, which is the protein component, together with the heme component. That's what's called hemoglobin. Uh, this is the biconcave disc. Let's note this. It is shown here in a scanning electron microscope. So circulating RB is a in nucleus, most organelles, including your uh, membranous organelles. And they cannot repair themselves because, as we said, there will be no organelles. They die within 120 days. Now, where do they go? They die in the spleen. And you will realize later on the important role played with the spleen because it is in the spleen that the red blood cells will be recycled, particularly the iron component. So the iron will be brought back to the blood circulation, to be brought back to the red bone marrow, where in these four elements will be formed, both red blood cell, white blood cell, including even the mega set which becomes the platelet fragment. So lack of a nucleus is important because as we said it is so small it has to be able to what traverse through the small capillaries. In fact a capillary can only allow the passage of one red blood cell. More room for hemoglobin again the lack of mitochondria. Uh, mitochondria uses oxygen to manufact manufacture the ATP as you can see in aerobic metabolism. So again, it's very important. It uses glucose as a source of energy directly. And again, as you can see here, it loses nucleus as it gets older, including all the other organelles. And the water accounts for 66% of the red blood cell volume. Now, the protein in red blood cell is known as hemoglobin. So just alone, you can see that the hemoglobin is the one that will be able to transport both oxygen and carbon dioxide. And we'll talk about where they will be attached to. So it has four polypeptide subunits, two alpha and two beta chains, and in the middle is a porphyrin ring, P-O-R-P-H-Y-R-I-N, which is called the heme component, which has iron in the middle, and it is the iron that binds to the oxygen. On the other hand, the carbon dioxide will bind to the polypeptide units. Again, take note, there are two alpha and two beta polypeptide chains. So both oxygen carbon do not compete with the attachment on their binding sites. Very important note. So here is a, uh, um, a hemoglobin with two alpha and two beta chains. That is the porphyrin ring which contains iron in the middle. So in fact, therefore, it can actually be able to have four oxygen molecules attached. And you can see here the carbon dioxide will be on the polypeptide unit. See, this is the iron, which as I said, is the one that will be binding with the oxygen. 
Now, block types, as we know, are known to be either A, B, A, B, or O. Type O is the universal donor, and type AB is the universal recipient. It's important to know why is it type A, why is it AB, why is it B or O. It has to do with the presence of what we call antigens on the surface of erythrocytes. Now, these antigens are also known as agglutinogens and can either be glycoproteins or glycolipids. Okay? On the other hand, in the cell, if it's in the cell, the, the surrounded by plasma, you have the agglutinins or what we call antibodies. So take note. Antigens are on the surface of the red blood cell. Antibodies are found in the plasma, which is also known as agglutinins. Again, it's very important to differentiate one from the other. If you happen to be type A, you have an antigen A or agglutinogen A. I am, in my case, I'm B. I have anti antigen B. And of course, um, we're going to talk about the antigen D later on. It's also known as the RH factor. We'll talk about that. And again, the antibodies, there are anti-A and anti-B. So, this is just an example here. Type A blood has antigen A and it has anti-B or B agglutinin, which means it hates, hates the B blood. On the other hand, like me, I'm blood type B. I have B antigen on my surface of my red blood cell, but I have anti-A means I will not like A's. So blood that can only be donated to be either could be another B or what O, okay? But whenever there is a type A, it will not be matched to me. I, I, will, I will have to suffer if somebody gives me a type A or if not even A, B, because at least both of them still has the A. And mine is A agglutinin. That means I hate A's, okay? So again, the blood type A, B does not have any antibodies in the plasma that makes them become the universal recipient. On the other hand, the type O from the word zero, there is no antigen on the surface of red blood cell, either, either A antigen or B antigen. That's the reason why it is considered the universal one. Donor, but unfortunately, it has both anti-A and anti-B anti anti antibodies in its plasma. Now, RH positive is a special type of antigen. It's coming from the word rhesus monkey. Uh, rhesus being a R-H-E-S-U-S, -E a special type of monkey species, which is, has the same antigen common to humans. Uh, like me, if I am blood type B, but I am also B positive, the word, the positive word there represents that I am Rh positive. And some people have Rh negative blood, that, that means they have no Rh antigen, or otherwise known as D, as in dog, antigen on the surface of the red blood cells. So just bear in mind that in our case, our red blood cell has either two types of antigen, either A or B, which gives your blood type, plus of course the RH or D antigen, okay? RH antibodies are only present if a person has been exposed to the RH factor, and you will learn the importance of these in the development of what we call hemolytic disease of the newborn, wherein the mother is RH negative and the father is RH positive, and when the woman or mother gets pregnant, the baby is RH positive. It could affect the, simple, uh, the, the, the subsequent uh, pregnancy, particularly the second baby, because if the second baby is still, uh, still RH positive, then because of the presence of RH antigen in the first baby, which could actually mix the blood of the baby and the mother during placental separation during delivery, the mother will develop antibodies against RH antigen, so that's the reason why the second baby may suffer because of the presence of antibodies. And it causes hemolysis or the red blood cells of the second baby will rupture and cause possibly his death. Okay. So here is just type A, notice surface antigen A, type B, surface antigen B is like a, like a blue triangular shape, uh, but that is not actually what it looks like, but it is for the purpose of discussion. Red circle for A antigen and blue uh, um, antibodies um, to antigen for um, B and in this case if it's type AB you have both the blue triangle and the red circle representing A and B antigens and take note O does not have any antigen A or antigen B which makes it universal donor AB would be the universal recipient because there are no antibodies in the plasma now in my case I am blood type B I have antigens or antibodies against A. Okay. 
with anti A antibodies. On the other hand, your type A will have anti B antibodies, they hate the Bs. While both type O, they have both anti A and anti B antibodies, that's why they can donate to everyone, but if they ca in case they are a patient who is type O is bleeding and he needs blood transfusion, he can only get blood from another one, type O, because of the presence of these two antibodies. Take note of that. Okay. So again, we, uh, you, you can just read all these subsequent slides, uh, whether it's safe or not, based on the principles that we have discussed, whether it's safe to nation or not, because it can lead to hemolysis if it's not properly matched. Okay. So. In the next slides, uh, which are the proper blood type, okay, and uh, take note that uh, you are concerned which one is safe and which one is not safe, okay. So just go over these slides and you will be able to make sure you understand why one is safe and one is, one is not safe, okay. So again, um, this is something that is very important because in the, in the nursing world and in medicine, we always do a lot of blood typing and uh, blood transfusion. Before we do any blood transfusion, we have to do proper cross-matching, making sure that they are compatible whatever blood we donate to the patient. Now, of course, uh, this is just again a series of things. So this is what happens. If you happen to have the opposing antibodies, there will be clumping and the result will be hemolysis or rupture or breakdown of the red blood cells. So again, as we already mentioned, there are three types of granulocytes, neutrophil, eosinophil, basophil, neutrophil, elevated in bacterial infection, eosinophil, elevated in allergy and par parasitism or parasite, basophil, elevated in allergies. And then for our granulocytes, you have monocyte, which happens to be the macrophage, macro means big, phage means phagocyte, which eats other bacterial cells, and lymphocytes, you have three here. You have your T cell, B cell, and NK, or what we call natural killer cells. So this is what it looks like, neutrophil. Look at the appearance of the uh, nucleus. This is the base of uh, eosinophil, basophil. Look at the giant macrophage, or what we call the monocyte, and this is the lymphocyte. So as we said, although it says here 6 to 9,000, 6,000 to 9,000, some books would say 5,000 to 10,000, if the amount of white blood cell is more than 10,000, then you have leukocytosis. L-E-U-C-K-O-C-Y-T-O-S-I-S. -E and, or they will also call it lymphocytosis. If it's low, it's called leukopenia or lymphopenia. Now, whenever we say differential count, it means that we want to be able to determine the neutrophil value, the eosinophil, basophil, lymphocyte, monocyte values. Okay. So when the doctor says WBC with differential count, you want to know the specific values of all those components. So here is another important consideration. White blood cells have a short lifespan, within a few days. They are, as I said, combat the allergen or the invading foreign body like bacteria or virus. And they can also squeeze to induce the cells to what they call diapedesis. At the same time, they're drawn toward infection by chemicals released by the body cells called chemotaxis, very important concepts. So what's the key word here in the slide? Neutrophil, bacterial infection. So whenever it's above 70%, that means you are dealing with a bacterial infection. And why are we concerned about that? Because we need to give what? Antibiotics. We never give antibiotics or antibacterial medication to viral infections. So again, the first, the one BC at the bacterial site is neutrophil, active phagocytic cells, but they can only live about 10 hours. Now, you see the fields, as I said, the key word would be allergy and parasites. Do not forget that. And again, for basophils, word, release of histamine and heparin. Histamine is seen in allergy too. And heparin is important. It prevents abdominal blood clotting. And again, the monocytes, as I said, is a large for the word macrophage, phagocytic cell. And they will release chemicals to attract fibroblasts that produce clotting fiber to surround an infected site. So basically that's a very important thing too. And then of course you have T cells, B cells, and NK cells for lymphocytes for part of the immune system to fight against infection. So T cells, as I said, attack the foreign cells directly, while B cells are converted to the plasma cell that produces antibodies to attack the foreign cells. And again, keyword immunosurveillance for NK cells. Platelets, as I said, they come from what big cell? Megacaryocytes. 
The reason why we say formally called thrombocyte because this is not anymore being used because site means cell, which is not the case, and thrombus means a blood clot. So we no longer use this because we know that this is a fragment of a cell. Okay? So 350,000 per microliter of blood, which is very important. Anything below that would be thrombocytopenia, which could lead to bleeding. So this is important again, as we said, it's the megakaryocyte, it became a fragment to become platelets. All the formed elements from the red blood cell, white blood cell, the platelets are formed in the red bone marrow. So what is the term used when there is decreased white red platelet count, thrombocytopenia, when it's above normal it's called thrombocytosis. So what is the role? Important for blood clotting, another word used for blood clotting is hemostasis to stop the bleeding. So take note, they will clump together to form a platelet plug. So if you have a break in the blood vessel wall, this platelet plug will attempt to plug the area where there is a, a break and therefore to stop the bleeding, okay? And that's why it says contain, contains actin and myosin. Remember these are the terms we used when we talked about muscles. Contractile elements and factor to contract the clot. Now, this is a topic that is not uh, important. It's important because it's how the, the blood is formed. It, it begins with the hematopoietic stem cells, which can either be myeloid and lymphatic stem cells, but take note that you can either have the myeloid cells called mucopenesis with all, all the cells mentioned here that are formed. So erythrocyte, plated, basophil, eucinophil, monocytes. Or the other one is the lymphopoiesis, which includes all these, the lymphocytes. So I don't expect you to memorize this, but just be aware that it could either be lympho or myeloid series. And as you can see here, this is what is going to be formed. Okay, we will stop there. And again, this is something, a very important chapter that we need to draw, okay?